We are continuing our study on the book of Luke. Have been for some time, will be for some time to come. Uh, maybe until the Lord comes back, we'll see. But uh, this is what we do. We want to worship God passionately, and then we just study the Word passionately. And uh, it's devoid of any entertainment factor. We just like to chew on this Word. Uh, I want to entitle this message, The Return. We're now proceeding on in our, our teaching on Luke chapter 12. Um, and this is called The Return because, as we'll see here shortly, it's about the return of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. And uh, we need to know about that. Yeah, that that's, that's good news. Last week we talked about how the foundation for uh, living without worry is having a trust in Dad, Abba Father, a trust. And uh, letting go of the things of this world and having all of our treasure in heaven. And there we saw that the Father, Dad, delights, delights in giving us the kingdom. We don't have to beg Him for it. We don't have to, you know, uh, plead with Him or impress Him or anything. He gets something out of the deal. It gives Him pleasure to give us the kingdom. And that really was a picture of God that was just, it captures the essence of the free and outlandishly merciful and loving uh, and beautiful God of the Bible, the God revealed in Jesus Christ. What is amazing, and I'm sure if you have been a Bible reader at all, uh, you have noticed this, and it really comes out in the teachings of Jesus, that you can have this sort of picture of God who just delights in us and sings over us and displays His love and mercy and grace, and it's too good to be true. You can have that, and then right next to it, you can find verses that are really in your face, tough, uh, even harsh, warning passages about judgment. And sometimes it's hard for us to put those two things together. Now, we're going to need to put those two things together this morning because last week was all this beautiful, free, uh, grace of God thing who delights in giving us the kingdom. This message, folks, is in your face tough. Can you handle the truth? <laughs> You're tough enough to handle the truth. But here's the thing. We can't forget last week's message when we turn to this. We sometimes have trouble putting this stuff together. Uh, and if we do, I think it's because we either don't understand love or we don't understand uh, discipline. There's these harsh discipline passages, like the one we're going to be talking about here this morning. Um, some people think that love is all just warm, fuzzy feelings, mushy-gushy stuff. Uh, and, and they have trouble thinking, uh, understanding how love can sometimes be tough and confrontational and, and, and result in discipline. But it can. Others of us have trouble on the discipline side of things. How can discipline be loving? Uh, if you were raised in a family like mine, I never got the point that the purpose of discipline was love. Now, if that was the intention of mom in disciplining me, she didn't communicate it very well. I associate punishment or discipline with somebody just losing their cool. That's my idea of God's wrath. You know, if I'm not careful, I can interpret that out of my own experience. It means God just lost his cool uh, and, and he gets mad. Punishment is what happens when... Uh, the parent can no longer control themselves and they take their frustration out on you. Now that is not God's mode of operandi, if you will, when it comes to punishment. But this is why we have to be careful that we hold these two things together. God is love. His essence is love. His being is love. He can't operate any other way than expressing who He is and that is love. And so even when God confronts us and warns us and disciplines us, he does it out of love. It's not about him losing his cool or anything of the sort. It's an expression of love. Now, it may not seem like that to us, but that's where we got to trust, that Dad always has our best interests in mind. Luther said somewhere something like this. I think it was in his table talks. He, uh, the, the reformer, uh, Protestant reformer Luther said, the heat of God's wrath is simply the heat of God's love when you resist it. And there, there's some truth to that. It's always motivated and driven by love. Okay, so remember, what we're going to read in this passage, we have to put in the context of God's love. But it's in your face, tough stuff. So starting with verse 35 of chapter 12, Jesus said, Be dressed, be ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they could immediately open the door for him. Okay, he says, Be ready. Like servants. The word like there lets you know that he's taught, giving you a parable, an analogy. The kingdom of God and life is like this. 
And as with all parables and analogies and metaphors in the Bible or elsewhere, everything hangs on you getting what the point of the, the parable or the metaphor is and what it isn't. A metaphor and a parable captures a truth and communicates a truth, but it doesn't try to communicate the whole truth. The point of this parable, we'll see here shortly, is about how we should live. The point of the parable is not to teach us something about God. So it's not a parable about God, it's a parable about us. Uh, you'll see that a little bit later on. Uh, the master went away for a wedding feast, and we know from the culture of the, that time that those wedding feasts could go on for weeks or even months if you had to travel a ways to get there. And so here's a master who went uh, away, left his servants in charge of the house, and uh, he's going to be gone for an indefinite amount of time, and they don't know when he's coming back. But they're, 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 they're taught to stay dressed and keep their lamps burning. But simply is to say, always be ready for the master to return home. You don't know when he's going to return home, but always be ready. Even if it's in the middle of the night, be ready so that, boom, you can open the door and let him in. Then looking at verse 37 and 38, Jesus says, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. Quite a role reversal. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. Note there that the return of the master is good news to all who have been faithful. It's good news. Um, and the master is so pleased with them that now he plays the servant role and serves them. That's a way of letting us know that in the kingdom, all hierarchies are going to come down. It's going to be a kingdom of mutual service and mutual love. Then in verse 39, Jesus says, But understand this one thing. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect. Jesus intensifies here the, the uh, unexpected aspect of this parable, the the, the idea of waiting and watching by reversing or by changing the metaphor a little bit. And now he talks about a thief in the night. Nobody knows when the thief is going to strike. And the thief, you know, intentionally comes in an hour when you don't expect. Well, that's how the return of the Son of Man will be. You don't know when it will happen. It could happen at any time. And then in verse 41, Peter says, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? In other words, is this just for us who are on your inner circle and who are leaders or is this meant for the crowd? And so Jesus will answer this question by going back to the servant metaphor, uh, but tweaking a little bit. Here's what he says. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? You need to know that in the, the ancient world, the wealthier states just didn't have a few servants. They had uh, a hierarchy of servants. There's layers to this. And a servant could, uh, who proved themselves loyal and effective would be promoted in rank. And the highest rank for a servant was manager. They managed all the other servants. Uh, the job of the manager was to reflect the kind of character the, 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 the kind of character the master had and to carry out the master's wishes to make sure that the staff, the servant staff stay on task and to make sure that their needs are taken care of, that they're getting their food and things of that sort. And then Jesus says, it will be good for that servant whom the master finds, that, that, that manager servant. It will be good if, uh, whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So once again, the main word here is good news. For the manager who is carrying out his responsibility well, it's good news when the master returns, whenever he, re he returns. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. This is a manager who's forgotten that he's a servant. He starts to act like he's a master, and he doesn't do it in a way that reflects the character of the master. He rather uses his position of authority to make the other servants wait on him. And when they, they don't go along with the program, he has them beaten. He has the authority to do that. And he's got access to the wine cellar, and apparently he's making good use of that. And so rather than doing the 